your holiness. Um, in the West, there was a tradition of making statues that had clocks inside of them. And some people say that the role of the moderator should be like these statues. Kasha. Statue. <laughs> which, which means that moderators should be silent and only keep the time. So, however, in both India and Tibet, some statues spoke. <laughs> so, since we have a little bit of time, I want to express this is this conference is taking place uh, during the 50th celebration of the 50th anniversary of the Central Institute of Higher Tibetan Studies and I want to take this opportunity to express my personal gratitude uh, to the Institute for I mean everyone knows that the, the main uh, task of the Institute has been to educate generations of Tibetan young people in the Tibetan cultural sciences, and it has been extremely successful at this. Um, perhaps less well known is uh, the contribution it has made to foreign, uh, foreigners who have come here over the years to study um, and to do research. I myself came to uh, the, the institute over 40 years ago and studied with uh, some of its teachers when I was a graduate student and working on my dissertation. And now, 40 years later, my own graduate students come to study at the Institute. And throughout this whole time, uh, the Institute has been a model of openness and hospitality, and for that I'm really grateful. And I also want to bring attention to the contributions that it has made to the international uh, dissemination of the study of Tibet and Tibetan Buddhism through uh, its research division, through the restoration division, and through a steady stream of cutting edge publications. Um, it has made great contributions to the study of both Tibet and Tibetan Buddhism. And for that, I'm grateful as well. So, with these prefatory remarks, then we begin our session this morning. Our first, the, as you see, the topic of this conference is Mind in Indian Philosophy and Science. And our first speaker this morning is um, Professor uh, uh, Shubda jo Joshi, who comes from, she's a retired professor of the uh, University of Mumbai. And I urge you to read the longer um, bi biographies of the various speakers that are located in the program book. Uh, Professor Joshi is now at the Chanakya Center for Leadership Studies, and her topic today is Mind in Sankhya Darshan. Professor Joshi. Namo Namaha. His Holiness Dalai Lama. My pranams, respected dais, scholars from all over the world. At the outset, I express my sincere gratitude for giving me opportunity to say something on concept of mind in Sankhya School of Philosophy which is one of the oldest philosophical schools in the Indian tradition. Since uh, time is to be used in a very sparing way, I'll straightway start with the uh, concept of mind with just one or two lines about importance of the topic. My presentation is mainly based on Sankhya Karika of Ishwar Krishna in Tattva Kaumudi. And the very opening stanza of Sankhya Karika refers to the 
concept of dukkha, sorrow or suffering, which is threefold. And sankhya, the very word sankhya, which implies discrimination between Purusha and Prakriti, suggests that it is the way to end the suffering. So the entire philosophy moves around Dukkha and Dukkha Nirasa in a way. Now, the question which is asked is what the role knowledge plays and how is it that the action to eliminate Dukkha is possible? And therefore, all those parts of evolution which participate in the process of knowledge and action become important. Even though it is just the concept of mind, which is the central topic, there is only just one karika which speaks about mind. And it is not mind alone which functions, that is the manas, but it functions along with two other aspects, the evolutes of prakriti, the first evolute of Prakriti, that is Buddhi, or Mahat, that is the great principle. Buddhi is also translated as will. It is also translated as both will and intellect. Along with will or intellect, it is also Ahankara, that is the I principle or ego. And then it is mind. These three, there is a technical term used for these three, and that is called antakkarana traya. That is, it is a trio of the internal. Whenever antakkarana traya is explained, the English translation used is that the triad of the internal organs. But what is important is that buddhi, that is the will, or intellect and ahankara, that is the ego principle, when is explained initially as the first evolute and the second evolute of prakriti, is not described as organ. I'll come to that a little later. What is very important, therefore, I will start my presentation with the first evolute, that is buddhi, which plays a very, very vital role in the process of understanding and doing right things. English translation of buddhi, as I said, is will. It is also defined as adhyavasaya, and English translation of it is determination. Determination, that is, to ascertain it definitely, to conclude by analyzing or investigating. It's also interesting that it is to prescribe imperatively to regulate and this buddhi is also defined as viveka purvaka nishchaya rupam jnanam it means that it is the determination the determination in case of knowledge which is obtained through viveka that is the discrimination between the matter and the spirit the consciousness in this, the first evolute of Prakriti is not the essence of it, but it is due to the proximity of Purusha, which itself is consciousness. And the first evolute where Sattva predominates, and therefore it's a very clear reflection of consciousness in, we may call it will or intellect or determination, because there is no difference between Buddhi and Adhyavasaya. It is also said by scholars that this state of evolution consisting of all connected minds of Purusha, individuation has not taken place at this stage because I principle or ego or ahankara comes as a second evolute. And therefore, it is most universal stage and is also called in Sanskrit Mahat, principle, the great. This 
will or intellect is very useful for Viveka Jnana, as I've already told you that, to discriminate between matter and spirit. What is very important is that, according to some scholars, it's will and intellect combined. Intellect contemplates the circumstances calling for action and provides the rule of conduct. Will controls the disposition in harmony with the dictates of the intelligence. And this takes place in will, and therefore it is will and intellect. And therefore it is said that Sankhya Buddhi does both the functions. Determination of duty, knowledge, detachment. It's called the principal agent. And when the internal three organs are discussed in the Karika, Karika 37, it discusses that buddhi or intellect is like the governor being considered superior to all other chiefs by virtue of his being direct agent of the king, while others like ahankara and manas, they are the village heads and only of secondary importance compared to buddhi. Buddhi is close to Purusha and gets very clear reflection and uh, it is of prime importance. Further, what is discussed is there are four properties of buddhi and the four properties of buddhi having sattva predominant, they are dharma, jnana, vairagya, aishwarya. Dharma is translated as virtue. Dharma also can be considered as obligation or duty. Jnana, knowledge, vairagya, that is detachment or uh, negation of any attachment as such, and aishwarya, that is power. English translation of the term aishwarya is power. And the other properties where tamas predominates is exactly opposite of this. I will not explain the opposite. I will go to straightway highlighting some important aspects of these properties. Dharma is defined as, like Nyaya Vaisheshika, Abhyodaya Nishreya Sahetuhu, Dharma. That is Tattva Kaumadi. And it means that it is this virtue or duty which is for material prosperity and for spiritual good. What is very interesting is that for material prosperity, the ways are Yadnya and Dana, sacrifice and charity. It also, in a way, preparation for Vairagya, giving away what one possesses. And for spiritual highest good, it is Ashtanga Yoga, and the word use is, commentary uses the word Anushthana, that is a constant, constant practice of the Ashtanga Yoga, all the eight Angas, all the eight parts of yoga, without a holiday even for a single day. That is the meaning of the term Anushthana. Then comes another aspect, and that is Jnana, it is knowledge. It is this knowledge which actually is responsible for uh, liberation. And there are three aspects of this knowledge. They are prakasha, that is illumination, knowledge illuminates. It is bodha, it is cognition, and it is bhana, it is awareness. Knowledge is divided into two, bhaiya jnana and abhyantara jnana. Bhaiya jnana for material prosperity, it is external knowledge. Abhyantara jnana, that is the inner and that is for the spirituality. And Kaumudi says very clearly that it is samyavastha of guna, realizing samyavastha of guna, not just knowing, but realizing samyavastha of guna, and also realizing the nature of purusha, nature of consciousness as eternal, as without any name and form, as pure consciousness, and as uh, omniscient, omnipotent, etc. Viraga is detached, that is the third aspect of uh, buddhi is viraga, detachment from indulgence of sense organs into their respective subjects. It is in a way purification of all that is because of the excess of tamas. It may be non-virtue, adharma. It may be ignorance, adhyana. It may be attachment, raga. And the elevation of, uh, elevation from tamas to sattva, may be possible through viraga. I will not uh, give all the uh, four types of uh, viragas. They are types which are discussed in Yoga Sutras of Patanjali also. Yatamana, Vyatireka, Ekendriya, and Vashikara. 
uh, because the time is short. And uh, only what is very important is these are to be uh, really practiced. <coughs> and then uh, uh, the Vashikara Vairagya, the last one is superior as it is described by Patanjali. But again, I'll not go into detail. And the fourth aspect of Dharma is Aishwarya, that is power. Again, they are eight in number, which again are descri described in Yoga Sutra of Patanjali as Siddhis, which I will not uh, elaborate. And only the last one, Ishwara Bhava. Now here, the knower actually has realized, experienced that discriminative knowledge, and therefore uh, he is uh, sovereign. Because the last one, Ishitva, or Kama Vasayitva, is translated as sovereignty. And it is infallibility of will by which all ele uh, elements follow the course willed by the liberated person. So whatever the liberated person uh, wills, it automatically happens. This is what the commentary says. Now this is buddhi. And it plays a very vital role in that antakkaranatraya, that is the internal three organs. Then comes ahankara. Now here the individuation takes place. And the mahat is really individuated. It is defined as abhimana. It is defined as ego principle. It is defined as I principle. It is from this that the assertion in the form of I am entitled to do this work. I am competent to do this. Or all these objects of sense are for my sake only. Such type of assertions are possible and that is ahankara, depending on this assertion, buddhi determines, that is the will determines that I should, or this should be done by me. This is how, after individuation, buddhi and then manas, they are coming together. And probably the reason is that in antakkaranatraya, the three are described as organs, even though in the evolution, they are not discussed as organs. Buddhi and Ahankara are not said to be uh, having name of organ. Now, from Ahankara, the later evolution takes place. And the evolution becomes complete here. Sarga becomes complete here. And the evolution is of two types. It is where Sattva predominates. And from that comes the five sense organs, then five motor organs, also Manas. So these 11 organs, they come into existence. And then from tamas, the five tanmatras, that is the subtle elements, and the five gross elements, that is the pancha mahabhutas, they come into existence. And then, as I've already said, the pancha jnanendriyas, that is the sense organs, the motor organs, and the manas. So we go to manas as the evolute of ahankara. It is defined as sankalpatmaka mana, that is one which deliberates. Now the distinction between determination and deliberation is important. Here, mind examines. It reasons for and against to have a choice. So maybe saushaya nirasa, that is the doubt, is eliminated. And then with careful consideration, careful discussion, the thing is presented to buddhi for a determination. Then buddhi determines and then prescribes imperatively the course of action. That is what the commentary says. Another characteristic of mind is that it is ubhayatmaka. Uh, it is ubhayatmaka, it means that it is the organ which is also can be classified as sense organ and also the motor organ. That is the cognition and action, both are possible when the mind is operative and in conjunction with respective organs, either the knowledge takes place or the action takes place, of course, along with buddhi, as it is explained later on. So only when mind cooperates with the org organs, then only the cognition or action is possible. And uh, uh, this is also explained that uh, how is it that uh, action is possible, the sense organs coming in contact and it is said that perception is primary and then the later knowledge follows. Mind perceives, but how mind perceives is also important. Sense organs present that perception in the way which is very vague as awareness and it is the mind which determines. It is the mind 
which decides that these are the qualities. We may say nirvikalpa and savikalpa, and it is this which passes to buddhi, and then knowledge takes place. What is very important is that the karikas refer as important aspect is antakkaranatraya, that the three coming together, that is the will, buddhi, that is the I principle or ahankara and the manas and also later on the indriyas, the five jnanindriyas, five sense organs and the karika says that the gates of knowledge are 13 totally. That is the three internal organs and the five external sense organs and that is how uh, the mind apprehends, puts it to buddhi and then buddhi decides and then the action takes place. This is how it is described. Antakkaranatraya has three swalakshanas, that is they have their respective essential qualities, which I've already explained to you as adhyavasaya, abhimana and sankalpa. But there is something common to the three and therefore the three are clubbed together and that common thing is that panchapranas, that is the vital airs of five types, which again I will not explain, prana, apana, vyana, udana, samana, they provide that energy to the entire mechanism, that is, we may say the human person is alive because of the panchapranas, which are common to will, common to I principle, and common to uh, deliberation. It is only because of the panchapranas all this is possible. And if the panchapranas cease to exist, then the function also stops. This is what is said, that the panchapranas are common. A detailed description of panchapranas, its location, its places, and then what is to be done, all that is given in the Karika also. It is given in the Yoga Sutra also. I will not uh, refer to that. Uh, only what is very important is the process of uh, knowledge and action taking place. And that I will refer. That ahankara, it's only when one becomes aware and that the first perception of the sense organs, then the mind uh, deliberates and then the deliberation of mind and then I consciousness uh, makes it aware that yes, this is happening with me and then the decision is taken by will or uh, uh, buddhi and then the action immediately takes place. A simple example is given that, uh, well, a robber is seen and a very furious robber there and uh, the mind uh, first perceives and then Ahankara says, oh, it's approaching me. And then the buddhi says, run. And therefore the running takes place. That is how the example is given. So there are 13 karanas. Karana means the instruments to acquire knowledge and the instruments to, uh, instruments to do the action also later on. There are three common, again, functions. Grahana, that is grasping. Retention or sustaining, that is dharana. And prakasha, that is to illuminate. And that is how the knowledge and action, a combination is possible. And that is why probably Professor S. N. Das Gupta uh, says that buddhi combines both the will and the intellect. That is, it obligatory, uh, it also uh, passes the imperative uh, obligatory uh, judgment. So, antakkarana, functions in three ways, whereas all other organs function only in present, the sense organs and the motor organs, whereas Antakkarana has the capacity to function in the past, in the present, and in the future. And that is how we think about the past, we uh, try to plan the future, and also we act in present. Now, what is important here is that the entire scheme of this Antakkarana Traya, its operation and the process of knowledge is for the sake of not only material prosperity, but it's also for the sake of Dukkha Nirasa, which is at the final goal, Viveka Jnana, the discriminative knowledge between Prakriti and Purusha. But very interestingly, Karika says that it is for both Bhoga and Apavarga. This entire process of evolution, entire process of the 13 karanas giving knowledge and action followed is for the sake of bhoga also, for the sake of enjoyment also, and for the sake of liberation also. So it is the same principle which binds, which is enjoyment, and it liberates. And that is why again and again what is told is that the practices should be such that sattva should increase and the tamas should be reduced. 
and for this rajas will be helpful because rajas in a way works only as a stimulator it either stimulates the increase of sattva or it stimulates as the increase of tamas and the whole mechanism is for uh, increase of this and that is why yoga also is mentioned again and again now a few questions for this and the questions are is this consciousness antakaranatraya or the entire mechanism or the mind even buddhi the answer is really no because consciousness is only purusha chaitanya is only uh, belonging to purusha and satkaryavada very clearly says that whatever are the characteristics of prakriti are not characteristics of purusha and whatever is there in purusha is not there in prakriti but it's only when the both come together and the process of evolution starts that consciousness gets into uh, it and the other question is is uh, are these all organs i think when the individuation takes place then they become organ but when they are treated as the first two evolutes of prakriti where universalization is there it's only egoness and it's only uh, will but then uh, when ego further evolution takes place and individual person coming into existence then maybe all the 13 can be used as karanas or organs as it appears from the commentary <coughs> whether they are really logical uh, concepts clarified in the uh, in the karikas yes they are logically explained no doubt about it but they are not merely logical concepts as the western uh, recent tradition is looking at study of consciousness many a times as they are the predicates and then classification of the predicates but here very categorically sankhya says that all these are ontological things now whether they can be called realities in a way it's a big question because only matter is real the evolutes are there and the evolutes go back to prakriti and Uh, the famous uh, advaita criticism is uh, on this account but for sankhya this is real because sankhya is a realist school and therefore sankhya says that the evolution is also real that is sarga also is real pralaya also is real so it's a realist school even though it calls itself as a dualist school it says that the entire universe coming into existence also is a reality now there are questions which uh, are that, that is there are uh, problems because of this position also but there is one advantage of the position of sankhya is that since mind is not alone and mind functions along with buddhi and buddhi is superior to mind as per the karika position uh, the will part of it that is the virtuous uh, practices and uh, the imperative part of it comes along with the knowledge and the difference between the cognitive knowledge and uh, the uh, ethical judgment this difference is in a way overcome in sankhya because uh, it is through buddhi uh, because of the four aspects of buddhi dharma jnana vairagya this is uh, possible so i think that uh, these are the um, uh, these are the uh, few points which uh, i suggested let's just last one because my time is up the word chitta is totally absent in the karikas and the word chitta once or twice in the commentary comes when the commentary speaks about antakarana traya so we may ask question to ourselves whether uh, yoga sutras when they talk about chitta and chitta vritti nirodha are they really referring to antakarana traya or whether they are referring to mind thank you very much <laughs> thank you thank you thank you i'm blessed so now we have time for discussion and we can begin with your holiness if you have any comments or questions Chandra Mamaji. 
어, 장생 에너지, 장생 에너지 수송거래. In the in the Tibetan uh, uh, monastic education system, we do study many of the in a classical Indian darshanas, which includes um, the five main non-Buddhist uh, Indian philosophical schools, and uh, there is a, a profound recognition that Samkhya philosophy is very complex and profound. In fact, there is a great uh, Tibetan scholar, Chunin Lama Rinpoche, who always used to say, when you think about Samkhya, you really have to think hard. <laughs> yes. Yeah, true. So these no ancient Indian knowledge, uh, I think very helpful to enrich is the knowledge or inner world. It's something very important. Uh, so one of my commitments now, try to revival of ancient Indian knowledge now in modern India. It's very important. Yes, Sankhya is a very important school. And uh, without taking into consideration Sankhya, even Vedanta cannot proceed. So uh, Vedanta also treats Sankhya as the Pradhanamalla the chief opponent because that's true if, if colleagues have questions there are microphones in front of you uh, please uh, you you have to there's a small button i think at the bottom on this one, you have to turn the microphone on. Small red button at the bottom, perhaps. Maybe I can start. Oh, please. Can I, yeah. please. So, Professor Joshi, one thing that would be really helpful is if you could explain in, in a very short answer how can we best understand the relationship between something like Sankhya Karika on the one side and Yoga Sutra Patanjali. Okay. Because as an outsider, when you read them, there seems to be a lot of similarity. Yes. It's a very good question. And what I, uh, this is my opinion. I'm just humbly putting it before you. You may consider this. You know, Sankhya thinks about liberation as difference between, or separation between matter and spirit. Yoga of Patanjali, when talks about kaivalya, it also talks about separation. It doesn't talk about unity. And therefore, and these two, Sankhya and Yoga, are always treated as Samana Tantra. That is, the two philosophical schools having some commonalities. Just as Nyaya and Vaisheshika have some commonalities. Mimamsa and Vedanta have some commonalities. Similarly, Nyaya, uh, so, sorry, uh, Sankhya and Yoga. Therefore, uh, uh, what we did in our yeah, so uh, what I feel is uh, Sankhya provides a philosophical foundation for yoga practices, and Patanjali Yoga Sutra it doesn't discuss any metaphysics as such. It only focuses on the modus operandi how actually it should be practiced and liberation is possible. Whereas the metaphysical, epistemological, and ethical uh, foundation is laid by Sankhya. This is how we perceive in our philosophy department of Mumbai University. And we were running courses in uh, Sankhya Yoga uh, to reach out to masses, where people were only knowing about asan pranayam. Uh, they did not know about the philosophical foundations. We tried to explain to them Sankhya Foundation and the yoga practices of it. And they, this is going on since 93 onwards. It is still going on even though I have retired. My colleagues are carrying this forward. And uh, so many years we are uh, running these courses for masses to make them understand uh, the, uh, um, uh, the, what His Holiness said. Uh, the value of our own culture and tradition. Thank you very much. Professor Mishra. Uh, <clears throat> one, time, one time in Delhi, uh, uh, 
on international Hindu conference. Yes. So they invited me. So I mentioned there, the ancient time, there are many, what's the day, Kasoda? Very in, so intelligent or oh, scholar, thinkers among the non Buddhist tradition. We can see some of the Buddhist text, like Arya Dewas, and also the uh, Dignath and uh, Dharma Kitti, and also there are many, many sort of Shishanta uh, Lakshida, uh, many sort of uh, the Buddhist text mentioned number of uh, the non-Buddhist thinkers. So it is very important to carry more study. You should not use it contented carry some pujas, uh, some sort of ritual. Absolutely. You must go deeper way study. That's certainly, certainly. Yes, we fully agree with you, sir. Sometimes, sometimes I feel when we're passing through a lot of small, small temples. Uh, good, but I think uh, instead of just one temple, I think sh create should kasuda should create penzu Instead, we should have libraries. Oh. Yes, sir. Um, small efforts from our side in the Department of Philosophy in this direction. We are approaching the common people and uh, right. they come in many number. Uh, when we started our yoga course for the first time, uh, 200 people came for enrollment. And it, it, it continues. And one, uh, one best thing about it is that people become aware of it and they start uh, thinking about it. They become more sensitive about the study of a text and uh, gradually come out of uh, such puja part and rituals. So I, I fully agree with you, sir. Yes. Ini so if, so if we look at the um, texts of uh, classical Indian Buddhist uh, institutions like Nalanda, um, there is a very strong evidence that these great thinkers in the past were really very broadly read. So for example, if you look at um, Bhava Viveka's Tarka Jwala, um, it is uh, an encyclopedia of Indian philosophy. Not only does it provide all the lists of the main tenets of the different schools, but also the reason and the arguments behind those positions, and as well as the critiques and objections from other schools and how the schools themselves respond yes. to these critiques. So all of this point towards an understanding in ancient India yes. that you know, a, a training of mind, really an education involves yes. having a broad based philosophical training yes. so that it's not simply you read and hear about something, but you have something deeply reflected upon so yes. that your knowledge is grounded in a strong understanding of the reasons behind these positions. Sure. Yes, absolutely. The, there's even a section of the Vinaya where it describes Buddhist monks studying non-Buddhist philosophy. And there, in fact, it says that monks should only spend a third of their time studying this, which implies that probably monks wanted to spend more time, and the Vinaya was trying to, to keep it to only a third of the time. And not only that, it also makes the rule that, that monks should not recite in, 
non non Buddhist philosophical works except at night. So, which which means, of course, that they were memorizing non non Buddhist philosophical works. So there's this tradition. Sometimes in the in the in the text, for specific reasons, some strictures are you know prescribed in reading outside your own tradition in a particular context. But generally, for broad education, encouragement is really made to have as broad philosophical exposure as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Mishra, did you have a question? So it was a very brilliant presentation, Professor Joshi. My question is, any creation requires the involvement of a sentient involvement mind. Of? Any creation yes. involves the involvement of a mind which is a sentient, conscious. Yes. If Samkhya talks about a mind which is unconscious, Prakriti is inert, Jada, Yes. Achetana. Yes. How will it be able to produce things since any production requires three things? Ichha, desire, oh. prayatna, effort, and krutimatvam, the capability to create. Three things. Yes, so sir, how um, will this alert got, mind create? Sir, I got your point. But <laughs> in I, at very initial stage I said it. I said that uh, consciousness belongs to Purusha, that is all right. But once Purusha and Prakriti come in contact with each other, the evolutes of Prakriti also become conscious. Now, whether that consciousness is the real essence of the products of Prakriti, the answer is no. But whether it, consciousness belongs to them, yes, we have to say that consciousness belongs to them. Otherwise, the entire exercise will become futile. There will be no deliberations, there will be no determination, there will be nothing of the sort. But this doesn't happen. Deliberation takes place. I think the crucial question for Sankhya is that why and how Prakriti and Purusha come together? That is the crucial question. But Karika very clearly says that they come together in the first evolute is Buddhi, where consciousness very clearly and purely reflects. And therefore, Buddhi has all these four aspects, Dharma, Jnana, Vairagya, and Aishwarya. And then the later evolutes, of course, by virtue of being evolutes of it, possess all this. Uh, only the degree is lower, 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 lower. But, but I think consciousness... Yes, okay, and unfortunately, we need to move on to the next paper because the time is yes. up. But thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much.